I'm Jesse Ventura. Stay vigilant and question more. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. The world according, according to Jesse. Yes, yes. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with acclaimed astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is a best-selling author, the director of the Hayden Planetarium, and the host of Star Talk. He joins me now from New York City. Neil, you open your latest book, Letters from an Astrophysicist, with an open letter to NASA in which you write about not seeing astronauts with your skin color. How did this inspire you to become one of the most famous people in your field? Yeah, it didn't at all. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. Okay. Uh, th this letter is, is in the form of a prologue. I did write a letter to NASA, and I didn't write it when I was a child. I wrote it last year when both of us turned 60. We are both the same age. We were born the same week in October in 1958. And I took that occasion, 60 years, to reflect on the fact that there were multiple Americas in the 1960s. And one of them was Mercury, Gemini, Apollo were landing on the moon, America the Great. And then there was the Civil Rights Movement. And I knew early of my interest in the universe, but I was also in the civil rights struggle. And so I just wanted to make sure NASA knew what I was going through at the same time they were celebrating their great advances. Now, when people ask you what race you are, and I love this because I answer the same way, you br and I didn't even know this, you brilliantly say the human race. Are you wrong yeah. about the concept of race? <laughs> <laughs> well, I see, people... We, we go out of our way to tribalize, right? We find out, let's, let's separate people by skin color or gender or, or language or who you worship or what side of a line in the sand you live on. And this tribalization, I think if you celebrated those differences, that's one thing. But if you used it to divide and conquer and declare that one is superior to another, that is a recipe for the unraveling of, of civilization. And we've seen examples of it in the First and Second World Wars. That's tribalization at its extreme worst. So, yeah, rather than try to tell people what I would be or what I, I, I just give the most unifying word I can come up with. What race? The human race, yes. You know, Neil, I love that you do that because I, I'm on Medicare now, and when I went in for Medicare, they asked that question, race. And I sat there mm. for a moment and thought, what do they need to know that for? And then it <laughs> dawned on me, I got the answer, so I wrote human in. And I hadn't even <laughs> read your stuff yet, so I've joined Excellent. you on that. Now, now you've, examined the, you've examined the historic relationship between science and the military. We're currently witnessing the creation of a U.S. Space Force. How does this make you feel to see astrophysics enlisted in the service of war. Yeah, I try not to have much feeling about it, more just observations. And it's been going on forever. That book, Accessory to War, The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military, my field, my community of astrophysicists, were overwhelmingly sort of liberal, progressive, anti-war, basically. Yet, we have been handmaidens to conquest and to hegemony since the beginning of, of civilization. And so this book was, that book, was an exploration, came out last year, an exploration of that relationship. Going forward, um, yeah, uh, the concept of a space force is not new, by the way. There's always been a space branch within the Air Force. It's called U.S. Space Command. And people worry that Space Force means we have lasers and bombs and things. I mean, think about how we've been using space ever since we've had access. We've had spy satellites up there looking at Russia, taking pictures, um, all manner of militarily useful hardware has been in orbit ever since we could put anything in orbit. So this is just a codification of what was always happening there. Not only that, you know, GPS satellites we know them because it can help you find where grandma lives on the map, but that was a military project. 
by the Air Force, U.S. Yeah. Space Command. And it was, they know where the missiles are headed. And where, it's how war went from just carpet bombing and big old bombs to precision targeting. Because the GPS signals tell the missiles exactly where they are and where they're headed. Now, like, Uber would not exist without GPS, right? Whole industries um, uh, rely on space assets. So here's the question. Um, with, it's not just the value of the hardware we have orbiting the Earth, it's the value of the commerce it empowers. When you add that up, it's trillion dollars. You would want the military to protect your assets. So it's not a stretch to say it's time for a space force. Plus, I would throw in, while you're up there, protect me from that asteroid that might be head, headed our way. Or, <laughs> or clean up the debris that's there. Add yeah. some uh, items to its, its portfolio. Can. Yeah. OK. <laughs> with, all the with all the problems we face on Earth, why is it important to step outside our planet and explore space for peaceful purposes? Well, so let me, let me take you back 30,000 years. If you were in the cave, here we are in the cave, and, <laughs> and you said, oh, gee, I wonder what that, what's on the other side of that mountain or across the valley. And I said to you, no, we have cave problems here first. Got to solve the cave problems. Then you can go outside the cave. That would sound a little weird looking back on it. So if you look at how small Earth is in the cosmos and how, much, how, how many resources are floating around in space in the form of asteroids and comets and, and moons of, of, of planets, it would be short, oops, excuse me, it would be short-sighted to imagine that this is a, uh, that Earth is all you need to think about and worry about as part of what would be part of the solution to the future of our civilization. So yeah, you wanna, you wanna go peacefully, yes, because who, who knows what'll happen if we start fighting in space? But I, I sometimes I have my doubts, given how we're already behaving on Earth, that all of a sudden we'll behave differently yeah. in space. <laughs> what are the most common facts that people refuse to accept about the cosmos? Oh, no, they, I think the basic ones they finally warmed up to, that the universe is old, unless you're a fundamentalist religious. The universe is old, we're expanding. And, but then there's the rise of the flat earthers. Like, who ordered that? You know, where did they come from? And so there are factions out there. I, they found each other. This is the, the new tribalism. It's you have an idea that's a little crazy, and in a cocktail party, you'd be the only crazy person with that idea. You type it into a Google search, and you find every other crazy person has the same idea as you do, which, which validates your belief system, making you think that you're thinking rationally when you're not. So all I can do is keep trying uh, by the way, this book, Letters from an Astrophysicist, these are people who actually wrote in with these issues. They're people who are, who are thinking about UFOs. Bigfoot have religious angst because they learn science later and there's conflict. These people at least wrote in to have a conversation. The ones I worry about are the ones <laughs> that are sure they're right and don't need to have the conversation that I'm offering. Now, there's still so much to learn about the universe. What's something that still completely baffles you? Well, so it's not just me. It baffles all of us in astro. If it just baffled me, I'd say, I got to go back to the, you know, read up on this. But I can speak of what baffles us all. That's, that's a bigger baffle than just what baffles Neil deGrasse Tyson. We don't know what 85% of the gravity of the universe comes from. This is the famous dark matter. Right, 85% of all the gravity we measure in the universe has an unknown origin. Also, the universe is mysteriously accelerating in its expansion against the wishes of gravity. We, we measure this, it's called dark energy. We don't know what's causing that either. Dark energy plus dark matter is 95% of what is driving the universe and we are completely baffled. All right, just, just, it's humbling, by the way. A couple of other things we don't know was around before the Big Bang, but we have top people investigating it. Also, I want to know how we go from organic molecules to self-replicating life on Earth. That transition is still a bit of a mystery. If we understand that, it'll give us very deep insights into the nature of life, not only here on Earth, but likely elsewhere in the galaxy. 
<laughs> I'll tell you, Neil, you're starting to lose me on the end of that one. But anyway, <laughs> what do you most hope people will take away from your work? That the universe is knowable, that the methods and tools of science give access to that knowledge, and that knowledge, once it's verified by experiment, constitute things that are objectively true in the world. And the good thing about science and the objective truths it establishes is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. So at some point, we need, as a nation, but also as a world, need to recognize the value of what scientists are doing in this world and heed that advice before it's too late to do something about the damage that we are wreaking upon this earth. It disrupting a biosphere that we're not separate and distinct from, we are part of it. And the more we realize that, and the faster we realize it, the more we will recognize how important it is to protect it. Because as we've said, we are borrowing this earth from a generation yet to be born. I'm Jesse Ventura. Stay vigilant and question more. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. The world according, according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. I continue my conversation with acclaimed astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's a best-selling author, the director of the Hayden Planetarium, and the host of Star Talk. Neil, in your latest book, contains letters from correspondence with strangers about science. What are the most common types of questions people ask you? Were they philosophical scientific? About the meaning of life and stuff like that? Yeah, in fact, almost, I'd say most of the book contains questions of, that uh, capture people's discomfort with some place that they've found themselves in life. Uh, there's a whole chapter on life and death where people are, one person just learned he's got six months to live and wanted to write a thank you letter to all the people who, whose uh, material he consumed in retirement, uh, videos where he, he was a lifelong learner and he said, don't cry for me, but just, uh, I, just, I'm just want, I just wrote to say goodbye because you helped make my retirement that much more enlightening and beautiful and wonderful to maybe appreciate the universe. This was very touching for me. I think most people have never even met a scientist, much less be able to claim one as their friend. And I get the feeling that many of these people were writing to me as their friend because their decisions they were trying to make in their lives. Some people raised in a religious tradition and they learned that science conflicts with it. And so they want to know where can they coexist. Um, other people, they've had a, a UFO experience, but they want to know what could it have been uh, if not an alien. Uh, someone asked about Bigfoot. Someone had a conversation with her dead father in a funeral parlor and recounted that conversation for me and asked, what do I think happened there? And in that case, I said either it was an acoustic hallucination, because all your senses could be hallucinated, or you actually spoke to a dead person. So here's what you do next time. Ask this set of questions instead of what you did ask. Ask, where are you? Do you eat? Do, where do you get your groceries? <laughs> you ask, you know, make that a science experiment. Come on now. You're talking with the other side. Uh, so, so I give tips for next time you're talking to a dead person. But the, the, the difference is, these letters are not just me pontificating. I care about where the person is coming from. Where, what landscape are they asking their question from? Right. And I then try to have my response intersect their receptors for learning and for inquiry. And then it's a real exchange of communication. And it's not just me lecturing or pontificating to people. That would not be, uh, that wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be the contract that's implicit in a, in, in a letter exchange uh, with someone we're trying to get expertise from. Neil, what's the next frontier of the space race? Yeah, it depends on who you think is in the race. So we disinvited China to be part of the International Space Station. And so China says, okay, if we d you don't allow us in your sandbox, 
we'll make our own sandbox. So they put their own astronaut, Taikonaut, into space. They have their own fully developed space program, separate from anything we and Europe and even Russia have, have engaged in. So there are many on our soil that see China as the next competitor on the space frontier. But apart from that, other countries are joining the fray. Uh, India just had a mission to Mars. They think that the lander might have crashed, but they have orbiters. They, the fact that they got to Mars at all is, a, is a, an important start. United Arab Emirates wants to go to Mars. So we're turning into a world that used to have just one or two spacefaring countries to now spacefaring uh, abilities might be a, a global phenomenon. Plus you have private enterprise coming in. All of this, um, I think, in the end, can be for the good, provided we have the proper, uh, pro provided we shepherd this activity in ways that for, are for the greater good, rather than for any kind of uh, reasons of dominance or military superiority. Now, what cosmic ventures are on the horizon that you're most excited about? Yeah, I. Um, what good thing about my field is that that any next discovery is kind of built into the next spaceship that we're launching, the next space probe. So I'll give you an example. Jupiter has many, many moons. And one of them is icy on the outside, but liquid ocean on the inside. It's been liquid for billions of years. All life on Earth suggests it began in the oceans. So could there be life swimming in the oceans of this moon of Jupiter? It's called Europa. So I want to go to Europa, uh, cut a hole, go ice fishing, see if anything swim, swims up to the camera lens. And so the search for a life is a big driver of what NASA's mission statement has been in recent years. Neil, you don't have to go there. Come to Minnesota. You can make all the holes in the ice you want. We got 10,000 lakes. <laughs> That's right. The original, the original home of the Lakers is that they were the Minnesota, the, the exactly. Minnesota Lakers, right? Right. No, the Minneapolis Lakers. Oh, the sorry, Minneapolis, Minneapolis Lakers. Lakers. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway, NASA's chief scientist says we might find life on Mars within the next two years. What is NASA doing to make this a reality? Well, so next two years, that's ambitious. I don't know what he's got up his sleeve, unless there's data that hasn't been analyzed yet that upon analysis will show a record of life. Um, but Mars remains the most tantalizing target in the entire solar system. Mars rotates once in 24 hours. Its axis is tipped like ours is, which means it has seasons. It has polar ice caps as we currently do, okay? And <laughs> the, on, the surface, on the surface, it has evidence of liquid running water that is coursed on its surface many eons ago. We think that water is still there, but maybe in a permafrost. If it is, could there be aquifers beneath the soils where microbes are living? So anyone who talks about Martian life, they're not talking about Martians with antennae and ray guns, they're talking about microbes that could be thriving on Mars. And if we find life on Mars, which is a, one of our nearest neighbors, that greatly magnifies the prospect of life, of the galaxy being teeming with life, and that we are certainly not alone in the galaxy. If, if, this, if we have that evidence added to what is already our very, um, uh, our very um, our positive, uh, 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 speculations about what else we might find. Now, do you think human missions to Mars are actually likely in our lifetime? I'd be so disappointed if we don't end up sending humans to Mars in our lifetime. Now, you just said you're on Medicare, so I don't know. <laughs> they better keep you alive long <laughs> enough so that we can get. <laughs> um, uh, so you just said you said it offline to me that you were going on to Medicare. Um, sure. The but I but wait, <laughs> Neil. I, I wait, Neil. I work out every day, though. I'm in good shape. I'm the weight I was when I got out of the Navy back at 22 years of age. So I might be longer than you think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. So guaranteed, we'll send people to Mars in your lifetime. Um, we have to ask, what's the motivation? It's not just we're explorers. That's why we do it. 
because that's not why we went to the moon. We went to the moon, we were in the middle of the Cold War, we had to beat Russia, the Soviet Union, to the moon, and we did. Then we find out they weren't going to the moon, then we stopped it altogether. We didn't just continue on to Mars. So we need motivation. I, you want some motivation? If China says they want to put military bases on Mars, we're going to be on Mars in 10 months. <laughs> <laughs> One month to fund, design, build a spacecraft, <laughs> nine months to get there. Um, so the geopolitical forces that get us into space, who knows what that landscape is going forward. But tourism is a very sort of economically fertile path that could end up getting us to Mars sooner than you might think. Well, let's change directions a little. Scientists claim we have the technology to send unmanned probes to Venus. The planet is often described as a smaller sibling to the Earth. What can you tell me about Venus, and what do you think a mission there should focus on? Yeah, so Venus, their atmosphere is very thick, a hundred times the thickness of Earth's atmosphere, and it's almost entirely carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And so Venus, the little bit of sunlight that gets through, that energy stays. And the temperature of Venus has risen, so that's more than 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So yes, it's about the same size and mass as Earth is. So we want to think about it as a sibling planet. But when you look at the conditions on its surface, it would vaporize whatever you put there. So any probe you send has to be highly temperature resistant, high temperature resistant, to those conditions. No one is expecting to find life there. And you want to know how hot 900 degrees is? If you take a pizza, put it, an uncooked pizza, put it on your windowsill, it'll cook in about three or four seconds. You would cook too, so <laughs> just the pizza. Well, your oven is the outside of your house. Uh, so uh, well, why Venus does, is, why, is- Why does, pre why does President Trump want to turn us into Venus then? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, people, so the good thing about the planets is you get to learn bad stuff happened to these other planets. There are lessons to be learned from the planet on our left and the planet on our right. Mars once had water, it doesn't anymore. Venus is our size and weight, and it's got a runaway greenhouse effect. This is called comparative planetology. The people who say, let's only focus on Earth will miss the lessons that can be gleaned by exploring not only our solar system, but the rest of the thousands of exoplanets orbiting other star systems out there in the galaxy. Now, commercial space flight companies want to send civilians to the moon and to the International Space Station. What do you think about space tourism? So I, I love space tourism, but what I would do is whoever builds the rocket to first take people up, I want them to send their mother first. <laughs> See if she comes back <laughs> intact. <laughs> then I'll take this ship to the space station, to the moon, Mars, and even beyond. I've, I've said this to Elon Musk's face, by the way. Are you gonna send your mother? He said, no, of course not. <laughs> no, like early days of aviation, there were aviation accidents. You know, there, there will be problems. So depending on what your risk tolerance is, for how, when you step into that and when you don't. That's really what it will come down to. But we always have high-risk people, people who love taking high risk in our species. They're the first out of the box to jump, on, to jump on the ship. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Neil deGrasse Tyson, I want to take this moment, though, to say thank you. From the bottom of my heart, it's been a true honor, and I'd love it if you come back again. You're, like I told you before we went on the air, you're the second guy that's been able to communicate physics to me. My high school teacher, Ralph Blake, was the first. I actually passed physics, but you're number <laughs> two, because you talk to people where we can understand it, and that's super important today. Thank you well, very much, Neil. Thank you for that interest, and I'd love to come back at a future time. The world according to Jesse. Yes, yes. Thanks for watching. Send us your comments on social media for a chance to be featured in next week's episode. We'll be covering more stories ignored by the corporate media. And always remember when the government lies, the truth does become a traitor. Stay vigilant and also have a very Merry Christmas.
the world according to Jesse. Jesse. Jesse.